In the last video of this series, we spoke about active radar homing for air-to-air -air missiles. In this video, we get up close and personal with the most famous missile that uses this technology, the AIM-120 AMRAAM. Coming up! Welcome to Millennium 7 Star, the channel that helps you make sense of military history and military technology. Today we are going to metaphorically dissect the AIM-120 AMRAAM. Mind, even though you will find plenty of videos about the AMRAAM, the things that we are going to discuss today are not easily found anywhere else on YouTube, so you want to stick around till the end. In the meanwhile, please subscribe or hit the bell so you won't miss any episode of this series. And now, with no further ado, let's get started! So, AMRAM is not a name, it is obviously an acronym. It stands for Advanced Medium Range Air-to-Air -air Missile. In my mind, a question rises immediately. Advanced compared to what? What did they mean with a name like this? And to understand what happened, well, we need to learn the history. In the 50s, the US introduced the AIM-7 Sparrow. It was a semi-active radar homing missile. It was fast, it was light, it was introduced with high hopes. It was expected to render the dogfight completely obsolete and guarantee the American air superiority. Nothing like that happened. Its performance was dismal against any kind of maneuvering target. In, during the 60s or the 70s, in the skies above Vietnam or uh, the Middle East, supersonic fighters still relied extensively on cannons for air-to-air -air combat. Improvements were made, both in the US and abroad, but still, during Desert Storm in 1990 and 1991, about two-thirds of the Sparrows launched didn't hit the target. So, well, clearly something better was required. As if this was not enough, the US Navy during the 70s actually realized that they needed a long-range weapon to defend the fleet against the Soviet long-range bombers. Now, the Sparrow, used by the US Navy as well, being a semi-active rather homing missile, has an inherent flow. This kind of guidance becomes inherently less accurate with distance. And the reason is not technological, it's purely physical. The radar beams that guide the missile becomes wider with the distance. It is a very narrow cone, but a cone nonetheless. So the longer the range, the less accurate the missile becomes. US Navy answer was the AIM-54 Phoenix. It was a powerful and long-range weapon with a big radar in, in the news. Being large and using active radar homing, it actually achieved the range requisite and the precision requisite. But there was a flip side. The missile was very complex, it was very heavy and extremely expensive. An F-14 Tomcat could take off with six Phoenix, but couldn't land with all six of them. Also being designed to target slow and lazy bombers, it lacked the agility to engage fighters. Well, to be honest, the Phoenix is used by the Iranians against the Iraqis during the Iran-Iraq war didn't really do too bad, but, well, it was clear that the missile was a technological dead end. So what was needed was an active radar homing missile, pretty much the size and the weight of the Sparrow, with a medium long range. The problem was that it was impossible to cram the electronics required for active radar homing in a body the weight or the size of the Sparrow. Remember, we are still in an analog era and uh, the digital electronics was still at the beginning. And in fact, the services had to wait that digital electronics became available. Actually, at the end of the 70s, there was a window of opportunity to be part of a multinational program. 
So following a multinational agreement, the United States became responsible for building the active rudder homing uh, missile medium range, while the Europeans became responsible for developing a new infrared homing um, short range missile. Uh, the program was not exactly a success because a lot of countries basically drop out and uh, yes, there was no multinational approach anymore. However, the US part of the program went ahead. The final competition was between Hughes and Raytheon and in 1981 actually Hughes won and started the full-scale development. The program had quite a bumpy road as it often happens with very sophisticated weapon systems. In 1988 the final result was approved and the initial production started with the use as the prime contractor and Raytheon as a secondary source. By the way, in 1997 Raytheon will acquire use and it will remain the only manufacturer, so one may wonder why they do tenders. Anyway, in 1991 Hughes delivered the first official production version, the 120A, which was called the Slammer. The weapon joined the units just in time for a desert storm, but apparently no missile was ever launched during the war. Or at least this is the official version. So the Amram is built in steel and titanium. It has four wings and four fins. All of them are detachable for transportation purposes. It is 3.66 meters long and weight approximately 150 kilos. The airframe is divided in four major sections, guidance, propulsion, warhead and control. The guidance section houses an active X-band high power radar seeker, which is used for terminal guidance. The radar antenna is a mobile antenna mechanically actuated and mounted on a gimbal. Navigation, autopilot, radar, data link, fusing, sequencing, self-test. All these functions are handled by a single microprocessor clocked at 30 MHz. The A version software had about 27,000 lines of software written in assembly language. The propulsion section houses a solid fuel rocket motor. The rocket motor is believed to be a dual thrust motor in the sense that it will provide a very high thrust at the beginning for a few seconds and it will provide a small amount of thrust for a longer period during the cruise of the missile, actually helping the missile retain the energy. The maximum, the maximum declare speed is about Mach 4 and for the A version, the range was supposed to be around uh, 45 to 50 kilometers. Obviously, as we have seen in the, our past videos, ranges are not really reliable numbers. In long range engagements, the slammer heads for the target using the inertial guidance. During flight, though, it receives updates via data link about the position of the target. It then transitions to a self-guiding mode when the target is in range of its own radar set. Obviously, having its own terminal guidance and just requiring a data link during the intermediate flight, it doesn't require that the launching aircraft points its radar uh, directly to the target for all the time like it was necessary with the Sparrow. We will see this when we will discuss semi-active radar homing. An interesting feature is that if the target tries to jam the radar missile actively, then the missile can recognize the situation and switches automatically to a home on jam mode. This means that the missile tries to navigate toward the jammer. This is obviously very useful in combat, however, the precision of this kind of navigation normally is very very low. The Amram Fragmentation Warhead weighs about 22 kilos and it is activated by a radar proximity fuse. The effective range of the warhead was never made public. 
like every modern weapon, the Amram has gone through a lot of transformations and improvements, and the missiles in use today are quite different to, uh, compared with the original version that it was the one that we have just described. The B version was available from 1994. It was the result of a producibility improvement program, so the missile was easier and cheaper and quicker to produce. There were a number of improvements, but two are crucial. First, the microprocessors were replaced with a quicker one. Second, the weapon's memory was replaced with an EEPROM set. This is a crucial improvement because it means that the software that guides the missile can be updated even in older missiles, in missiles that have been already produced. So every improvement in the theory of control laws or anything else could actually be incorporated in the missile while just programming the APROMs. The C version started being delivered in 1996. And to be honest, it's actually just a catch-all name for a large number of very different subversions. There was an aerodynamic change. The fins and the wings have been clipped to fit inside the F-22 Raptor base. The radar antenna was improved. The fuse was improved as well. And there was, as expected, a large number of different improvements to the guidance software all very cleverly delivered incrementally. Some of the improvements attained are actually secret, but we know that the range of the seeker has been improved, that the guidance laws have been improved, so the trajectories flown by the missiles are more efficient, and uh, there's probably something else that we really don't know. However, it is interesting to notice that smaller components, uh, I mean smaller integrated uh, circuit components, were used in the guidance section. And this is quite important because it leaves some room for further improvements. Version D, which is in production now while we speak, in 2019, is definitely a radical improvement and a radical departure from the older versions. This means that the range has increased, but also the energy available to chase the target has increased dramatically. One of the points that were stressed when the missile was actually made public was the increased capacity of engaging targets off board site, meaning that uh, the missile could be launched against a target that was not, let's say, in a frontal cone of the plane only, but also against targets in a lateral position in respect to the plane. Another important replacement was that the inertial guidance unit was replaced by a GPS-based one. This means that the missile knows its position with much more precision than before, so it can profit from the mid-course updates in a better way. Many believe that the D version actually maxes out the potential of the missile, which may be true from the point of view of the hardware, but we are sure that the software is going to be updated constantly. As we have learned in previous videos, the guidance laws are crucial to the performance of the weapon, so we may expect a constant improvement of the guidance laws till the end of the useful life of the weapon. This is the end of the story, but it's not the end of the Amram. We are going to see it hanging from military plane's wings for a very long time in uh, the future. However, there are some competitors that are already knocking at the door, and they're going to be very fierce competitors. Now, if you like the video, let me know in the comments below or just hit like. Please subscribe, hit the bell so you won't miss any, any episode. If you want to learn more, please don't forget to watch the videos around me. And for the moment being, thank you very much for watching. Goodbye.